and welcome to this first scientific event of the UNESCO Bernard Maurice Chair. Of course, this is an online event this year because we cannot meet face to face and have the pleasure of welcoming our prestigious guests in Toulouse and, and Occitanie. Uh, before giving the floor to our speakers, Ron, Andres, and, and Rüdiger, you can see on the screen, I would like to say a few words about the share and also thank the institutions and people without whom this event could not take place. First of all, of course, a special thoughts with emotion for our friend Bernard Maris, uh, for participants who do not know Bernard. Bernard is one of the victims of the terrorist attack which affected the Charlie Hebdo Journal in 2015. But he was also professor of economics at Science Po Toulouse and research fellow at Le Reps. And then the share was created in his honor to mark his attachment to the dissemination of economics ideas to society. And Ron Boschma is the share holder. Ron is professor of economic geography at the University of Utrecht and a very influential researcher in the, in the world. And we are very happy at Science Po Toulouse that he accepted three years ago uh, to hold this chair and to promote the research we, we made on the, um, in, in the chair to, to society. In particular, as it is the case today uh, and in the weeks to follow, uh, Ron has invited prestigious colleagues on crucial issues on, in regional development and regional transitions. Uh, thanks also to Arno and Alex, our wonderful geeks who organized all the promotion and the technical organization of this event. And of course, big thanks to you, Ron, Andres, Rudiger. Uh, you know that we are very impatient to be able to welcome you in the coming month in Toulouse uh, for science and beyond. Finally, before giving the floor to you, Ron, uh, on behalf of Science Po Toulouse and the Reps, I'd like to thank our regional institutions, the Occitanie region and the French Department of Haute-Garonne for the support and the, the promotion of the share. Ron, I will give you the floor now and wish everyone a, a very good seminar. Ron? Okay, uh, thanks very much, uh, Yoram, uh, for your uh, very uh, nice introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, to be part of uh, this event. Uh, I think I'm very excited uh, to be part of it. Uh, it's uh, as Jérôme said, it is part of uh, this uh, Bernard Maris uh, chair of which I'm uh, the holder. I'm very uh, honored and very privileged uh, to uh, to have that task. And uh, and and uh, and as Jérôme said, uh, we started that uh, three years ago, and uh, I enjoyed every minute uh, of it uh, uh, till so far. It's indeed a pity that we have to do this online and we cannot meet face to face. But hopefully, uh, uh, the the situation will soon. Uh, be much better and that we are all uh, uh, able to meet each other uh, face to face again. Um, I will say some uh, introductory uh, words if my slides are moving. Yes. Um, three years ago, uh, in fact, in, uh, in 2018, in November 2018, we had uh, the launch of the chair, uh, which, which I remember as a wonderful event uh, in Toulouse, uh, uh, where also the, uh, the family of uh, Bernard Maris uh, was present and they participated uh, in the whole event. Um, and, and there we decided to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, present the program that we had in mind uh, for the next three years. Uh, um, of which uh, the, uh, the chair would be part. So we decided to uh, uh, um, think about uh, three key themes that we would like to draw special attention to uh, um, uh, and which would fall under this chair. Uh, the first year we would uh, focus on uh, one of the main uh, social challenges that we all face nowadays, uh, which is uh, sustainable transitions, um, uh, especially from a regional perspective. Uh, so we had some uh, some events that were really were really focusing on that uh, very important uh, theme. Then uh, the next theme that we uh, were drawing attention to, and that of course is also very much on the scientific, but also on the policy agenda of many, is the the, the notion of socio-economic inequalities. Um, there we also had some wonderful events uh, last year uh, that were uh, focused on this particular theme. And now uh, the last key theme is about crisis, economic crisis more in general, but of course we are in the midst of the, the COVID crisis. 
uh, and we uh, um, are very keen on knowing how that will affect our cities and our regions in the future. So this is really also the key topic of, uh, of the, uh, the uh, workshop today. Um, as I said, uh, we started this all uh, with a kickoff meeting in November 2018. Uh, there, the, 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 the general theme was transition and regional innovation policy. And we had very distinguished speaker, speakers uh, in, uh, in that event. Uh, Jeroen uh, was one of them, uh, but also my Utrecht colleague, Pierre Alex Ballon, uh, Peter Bergowitz from the European Commission, DG Urban and Regional Policy, Raquel Ortega Arguiles uh, from the University of Birmingham, David Rigby, uh, Professor of Economic Geography at the UCLA, and Lea Fünfschieling uh, from Lund University in Sweden. And that was really a fantastic kickoff meeting uh, uh, that uh, um, was soon followed uh, by, uh, by a next meeting in April 2019, which was entirely focused on the theme of sustainable transition. And there we had a guest professor, uh, Lars Kuhne, uh, uh, who was working at that time at the uh, University of Melbourne. He, in, the, in the meantime, he has moved to Norway, uh, but is really one of the leading experts on the, on the geography of sustainable transitions. And, uh, and we had a wonderful event uh, in April 2019 uh, uh, in which he focused on this notion of sustainable transition. And we had really some wonderful debates uh, 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 coming out of that. Um, then uh, uh, in November 2019, uh, we focused on the second theme on inequalities. And we had very two high distinct speakers that were also uh, guest professors uh, that came to Toulouse uh, for one week. Uh, uh, which is also part of this chair. Um, Elisa Giuliani from the University of Pisa and Neil Lee from the uh, London School of Economics. And they, uh, um, from, from different perspective, they, uh, uh, they captured this, uh, this theme of inequalities. Uh, uh, Elisa more from a human rights uh, perspective, uh, while uh, um, uh, Neil more from a kind of socioeconomic inequality uh, across regions uh, uh, um, in the US. At the same time, uh, we organized other events uh, with very distinguished speakers uh, um, uh, uh, that are very uh, uh, well known worldwide. Uh, Michel Alietta uh, um, was, uh, was uh, one of the leading uh, founders of uh, the, the regulation school in France, uh, who talked about inclusive and sustainable development and to, uh, to what extent those are uh, compatible. Uh, uh, um, Joseph Stieglitz uh, needs no introduction from Columbia University, Nobel Prize uh, winner in economics. Of course, Thomas Piketty, uh, uh, who presented his new book, uh, Capital and Ideology. Uh, and we had uh, a wonderful event uh, with Katharina Pistor from Columbia University. Um, so, so we organized quite a lot of events uh, with very distinguished speakers. This uh, uh, will be followed uh, by a number of uh, uh, seminars uh, uh, that will be uh, um, that will start today, and that will all, all will be organized in the upcoming weeks. Um, uh, as you know, today Andres Rodik uh, Posio uh, from the London School of Economics uh, will uh, uh, give uh, 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 the first kickoff uh, in this uh, series of seminar. Uh, we'll talk about COVID-19 and the future of cities, and I will just give the floor to him in a, in a minute or so. Um, the next week, we'll have, we will have Professor Simone Yamarino from the LSE, and uh, she will talk about recent inequalities and how big ten, uh, big ten companies uh, uh, have an effect on that. And on the 25th of March, uh, we have uh, Nicolas Vialet from, uh, uh, from Airbus, but he's also director of the Institute of Artificial Intelligence of Toulouse. Uh, it's just an in, a new institute that was, uh, uh, was created um, in Toulouse, uh, um, in which uh, really uh, uh, very distinguished schoolers are working, among others, uh, Cesar Hidalgo. Um, and, um, and he will talk uh, uh, about regional diversification and digitalization. So, the upcoming events today is this one. Next week, uh, um, that will start not at 5.30 as, uh, as today, but 5 o'clock from 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. And Peter Berkowitz uh, from the European Commission will be the main discussant. And then we have the, uh, uh, the event on the 25th of uh, March, uh, which Nicolas Vialet 
and uh, uh, discussions uh, might be Alfira or Guara, although we still need to confirm that. Okay, um, this uh, is so far the all the events around uh, uh, the Bernard Maris chair. I now uh, I would like to give the floor uh, to the first speaker. That is, uh, of course, does not need any introduction. Uh, Andres Rodriguez Posi uh, from uh, uh, from the London School of Economics. He holds a chair there uh, um, and is a professor in economic geography. Uh, we all know him uh, from his uh, 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 presidency of uh, the Regional Science uh, Association International, which he uh, took on for, for a few years. Um, he's editor in economic geography, but he, he, he sits in many editorial boards. Uh, I think uh, I lost counting, but I think there are over 30. Uh, so he's a very busy guy. Um, and I also want to uh, mention uh, uh, the, the fact that he got an honorary doctorate at, Utrecht Univer at my university, Utrecht University, in 2019, which was a wonderful event, uh, which I still uh, uh, have uh, very warm thoughts about. And, um, well, of course, uh, uh, Andres uh, is probably uh, one of the most, if not the most productive uh, uh, economic geographer uh, he has uh, 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 more than 200 uh, scientific publications, uh, but let me just uh, mention one of them that really took off in the, in the last couple of years, uh, which is a seminal uh, pu publication uh, published in 2018 on the revenge of the places that don't matter and what to do about it. We all know that one. Uh, it's already heavily cited. Uh, it's, it's one of the most influential publications, I would say, of, of, of the last decade for sure. Um, so, uh, uh, so we are very happy to have Andres uh, uh, to take uh, uh, to, to do the presentation and to uh, participate in this kickoff. And then, after uh, Andres has concluded, uh, uh, Rudiger Arendt will uh, uh, step in as the main discussant. Um, also, Rudiger Arendt is, of course, very well known, uh, uh, working for the OECD where he's head of the Economic Analysis, Statistics and Multi-Level Governance Division uh, at the Center of, uh, for Entrepreneurship, SMEs, Regions and Cities. Before that, he was a very influential head of urban policy at, uh, at um, uh, DG uh, Public Governance and Territorial Development of the OECD. And in, in a life before that, he was also a senior economist uh, 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 at the OECD uh, Economic Department. So I'm very pleased to have these very distinguished speakers uh, uh, in, our, uh, in our session here. So I would uh, uh, first uh, like to give the floor uh, to Andres, who will uh, uh, present his, uh, his latest work on COVID-19 and the futures of cities. So uh, Andres, uh, please, uh, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Ron. Uh, bonsoir à tous et à toutes. Uh, good evening to everyone. And uh, it's a real pleasure for me to be here with you, albeit uh, virtually, in uh, uh, this meeting. I'd like to thank uh, Ron for the invitation, of course, Jérôme uh, for the responsibility on the Bernard Marie uh, uh, Cher, and also everyone that has been involved in the preparation for this. And last but not least, Rudiger for agreeing to actually uh, discuss uh, the whole presentation. And I look forward to a very interesting uh, presentation. Um, let me just share my screen, so in which the topic I'm going to deal with is uh, about COVID and the future of cities. And uh, this is the reason why COVID, we're having this meeting virtually and not in wonderful Toulouse. I mean, I'm hoping to go to uh, Toulouse in June and meet uh, many of you. But uh, maybe the Toulouse I'm going to go and visit might be a changed city from what it was just a year ago before the pandemic um, uh, started. And this is something that I'm going to try to discuss and see what are the implications of the COVID-19 pandemic uh, for the future of cities in the medium term after the pandemic is over. And this is work that I'm not doing alone. I'm going to try to uh, put together two papers that I'm working on, one with Chiara Burlina from the University of Padova, and the other one with uh, Richard Florida and Michael Storper, uh, Richard Florida from the University of Toronto, Michael Storper from UCLA, uh, Sciences Po and LSE. So let's go. And uh, what, are the, what are the 
geographic implications of what can be the geographic implications of the pandemic. And one of the things you probably have noticed uh, by now is that for the last year, almost a year to the day, I mean, today we're on the 11th, uh, I left uh, London to go into lockdown when my university closed on the 13th, so it's almost a year. This COVID-19 pandemic that we had uh, barely heard of and didn't pay much attention when the news were coming from Wuhan that it was starting has taken over our lives. Uh, our lives have been radically different from what they were not that long ago. And who knows, maybe they have been changed forever, maybe not. And this is something that we're going to be discussing, I'm going to be discussing in the light of changes to cities. But COVID-19 is not the first pandemic to strike the world. Over history, we have had a large number of different pandemics over time, the most notorious in the middle of, middle of the 14th century, the Black Death, that actually wiped, according to work by historians, one third of the population of the world at the time. Then there were the uh, infamous cholera epidemics of the mid 19th century that affected many European cities like Paris, like London, but also a lot of North American cities like Chicago, New York, in the mid 19th century. And the last global one uh, in this scale, of course, you can say there was an AIDS pandemic, but it's a very different type of pandemic, but was a century ago between 1918 and 1920, uh, the so-called gray flu or also known as the Spanish flu. And these pandemics always generated massive havoc and created high levels of mortality at the time. But I mean, there's hope. After the pandemic, there were, uh, the world rebounded. And the world rebounded not in the same way. It was, it was, it rebounded in many cases better. Just 50 years uh, after the pandemic was sitting some of the Northern Italian cities or Central Italian cities, many of these cities were seeing the beginning of the Renaissance, one of the best periods in, uh, let's say, in terms of progress in history. The cholera pandemics led to a transformation of cities and led afterwards to a flourishing of cities like Paris in this Im image during the Belle Epoque. And of course, the joie de vivre, the joy of life that uh, was taken partially during the First World War and the great flu of uh, until 1920 was followed by the roaring 20s, albeit that finished with the uh, financial crisis or the big crisis, the Great uh, Depression of the 1930s. So we are in a pandemic that so far, and thankfully, has had a lower toll of deaths than these massive pandemics that we have witnessed uh, in absolute numbers and also even more in relative numbers. But nonetheless, it's a huge global pandemic that as of today, and this is not the 29th of February, but it's on the 11th of March, has taken the lives of 2.6 million people across the world. And if you take the graph that I took today from the Washington Post, you can see that we are very much still in this, we have had false dawns, but very much very close to what seems to be the peak of the pandemic. Of course, there's hope. Uh, vaccination is, unrolling, is, is ongoing, is rolling, starting to roll in many developed countries. Another thing is developing countries, but there's much more hope I think now than there was just a few months ago about the outcome. But this pandemic seems to be having particular implications, especially for cities. It does represent for many commentators, a challenge for cities. Uh, why? Because uh, this has been regarded as a pandemic that not was not just born in a big city, Wuhan, but spread very rapidly through highly interconnected hubs where you had a lot of top international travel travelers with high air connectivity and therefore and it then thrive in cities with high levels of density this idea that the pandemic was born and spread through big cities and therefore cities are going to be the hardest hit and this might be a they might be first facing a, a turning point we have had now several decades in which we have seen cities of all types 
but especially the larger cities thriving to a far larger extent than what we have seen in the post-war decades. Since the 1980s, especially since the 1990s, it has been the period of the big city. And in places like the European Union, for example, what we have witnessed is that most big cities have been the fastest growing places in our countries with very few exceptions. So this in combination with uh, the worldwide spread of the pandemic has led some scholars to claim that this is the end of the large city as we know it. And um, I mean, this is something that has caught the attention, but it's a very ap apocalyptic type of prediction. And we have learned in the past to beware of ap apocalyptic predictions. But there are some signs that there might be changes. First is that um, many cities for large periods became relatively empty. There was a flight of certain types of uh, people to areas where they had second residences, where they had more space, where they would have and schools would be open for longer. And therefore, smaller, more remote locations seem to be offering a let's say, greater protection from the pandemic, a refuge, but also in a period in which uh, we can delocalize economic activity, we can remote work, uh, work remotely, we can give conferences from the comfort of our offices, home offices, that perhaps we don't need the city in the future, we're not going to need it in the way we have used it now. So is this the start, a new dawn for the city and a radical change, especially of the functions of the big city? But let's go from speculation to data and what has been the geography of the pandemic? And let's take a look at the geography of the pandemic at a regional level in Europe. And here I'm taking a look at excess mortality, which I think is by far, uh, although it's a very grim, but it's the best indicator of the impact of the pandemic. And this is for the first wave of the pandemic, the first six months of 2020 between January uh, and uh, the end of June. And here what we can see is that indeed, the pandemic has hit hard with an excess mortality that's more than 40% of the previous five years, some relatively densely populated big cities. That's the place of uh, case of uh, Milan and the surrounding region of Lombardy. That's the case of Madrid, the worst uh, where I'm sitting at the moment, and also the worst hit uh, region in the first wave of the pandemic. It is also Paris, it's London, it's Stockholm. There are other areas like Limburg in, uh, in the Netherlands or uh, Castilla-La Mancha with similar incidents. But in the whole, you can see that it took hold in many large areas and surrounding areas. By contrast, what we have is that in 40% of all European regions, these that are in this light uh, orange color, um, there was no excess mortality. In fact, there was lower mortality than the average for the previous five years. But we, it's very difficult to generalize because some big cities have been hit hard. That's the case of Madrid that I already mentioned. That's the case of Milan, but the case of London, but also uh, Barcelona and Catalonia and Stockholm and other regions like Castilla -La Mancha, uh, La, La Mancha, which surrounds Spain to the southeast. But we have also as well other regions that host big cities and that witness no excess mortality, at least during the first wave of the pandemic. That was, uh, for example, the case of Copenhagen, Warsaw, Lisbon, Berlin, and the regions of Lazio and Campania, which host respectively the cities of Rome and Naples, two of the three largest cities in Italy. So it's, it is not the case that all big cities have been hit and that all big cities have been hit in the same way. Of course, over time, this might change. We know that this virus is treacherous and it changes, it mutates, and then it has a different impact, impact in different place, places in the different ways. But uh, whereas some places and some big cities have been heavily hit, others have been somewhat spared. This is the same also within cities, not the geography of the pandemic within cities is not the same everywhere. This is a map of New York at levels of district. And here we can see that whereas 
the pandemic hit hard in places that are close to the airports, JFK in this in this place, uh, here uh, La Guardia Airport, and big incidents in terms of uh, cases and also of deaths. And in poor areas of the city, like for example the Bronx, it relatively spared um, areas that are more affluent within the city of New York, like for example parts of Brooklyn, like Brooklyn Heights, and most of the area in Manhattan, central and southern Manhattan, to a lesser extent, North Manhattan and Harlem. And this is, uh, can be seen in the correlation between incomes, income of the different zip codes in New York and the incidence of the pandemic, both in terms of cases and excess deaths. You can see that the worst hit areas were sometimes the poorest, but also those that had were in the bottom half in terms of income. But it doesn't happen. It's not that all cities, uh, it's, it goes in the same direction. If we do the same exercise for two cities that also witness a significant incidence of the pandemic, such as London and Madrid, and we look at the income either per borough or per district and the incidence in terms of cases, we have a line that in contrast to what we see in New York is flat. So on the whole, what we have is that the impact is very uneven, that it hits some cities and within some cities is concentrated in some places, but we still struggling with the causes of why this is uh, happening. So that's why with Chiara Burlina, I've been looking at factors behind this uneven incidence in different parts, which is something that is not just me, but quite a few people have been doing in recent months. And what we find is that, especially in the case of Europe, the incidence of the pandemic is very much related to wealth, uh, regional wealth, but mostly it seems to be affecting those cities and regions that are better off to a far greater extent than those that are lagging behind. Um, much to our surprise, uh, factors like uh, agglomeration and density, once you start controlling for the quality of and the preparation of the health system, once you start con controlling for the quality of institutions, once you start controlling for climate, et cetera, seem to play a far lower role than what has been highlighted until now, whereas connectivity matters much more. But it's not particularly air connectivity, it's not the sort of factor that might be highlighted as the super spreader dimension. And of course, probably the pandemic came by air, so by plane. But once air connectivity was shut down and that happened relatively quickly uh, within the lockdowns, what has been the main conductor of the diffusion of the pandemic has been connectivity by car, connectivity by road. Other factors, a very important factor that seems to be uh, coming out clearly is the readiness of the health system. Uh, the more doctors and nurse, nurses per capita, the greater av availability of hospital beds, the better, in other words, the, more, the greater the preparedness of the health system. Uh, the lower the incidence of the pandemic. Climate seems to play a part. Uh, it has hit far harder places that are colder and drier than warmer and uh, more humid places. And one factor that comes uh, strongly, comes out strongly, is the level of pollution of regions affecting more specifically, once you control for a lot of other factors, regions with a higher uh, level of particles in the air than regions with a cleaner uh, sort of environment. But perhaps the novelty and where I was more interested, uh, because it's not just my area of research, but it's where there had been less work done until relatively recently, was on the dimension of institutions. And here what came out was that once you control for a lot of other things, institutions matter and they matter a lot. Uh, the incidence has been lower in areas that have been decentralized or with a higher level of decentralization, but the quality of government, the quality of institutions, formal institutions matters enormously. We control for local institutions, regional institutions, and national institutions. And in that period in which uh, there has been a concentration of powers, at least in the early stages of the pandemic, in order to react to what was a 
global emergency, it seems that national institutions, so poor national institutions, poor quality of national government has been a factor that has contributed to the spread of the pandemic. But together with that is not statically, but whether these institutions have been deteriorating. Uh, whether we find that national institutions, in those cases where we find that national institutions have been deteriorating for the last 20 years, that's where uh, we find the cities and the regions that have been hit the hardest, possibly because of an overconfidence that they had a more prepared system to fight any sort of shock, risk, or eventuality than they were actually capable of preparing. Uh, they were actually, uh, that they were actually prepared, excuse me. Other factors that are important are levels of connectivity, how sociable the place is. Uh, we know how this virus is being tra transmitted, and there's no surprise here. Places where there was a more social life, where there was a, more, a greater tendency of indi individuals to meet one another on a more regular basis, uh, very often several times a week, those places have been hit far harder. But also the whole question of types of social capital. We control for different so, so, uh, so types of social capital. And the one that appears as most significant is mainly uh, the bridging social capital, where there has been a greater level of uh, bridging social capital that has made it easier to re uh, reach a uh, greater consensus. And that has been, uh, it has been far easier to make societies actually accept and participate in the harsh decisions that have been taken in recent uh, months. We also see in other work uh, that I've been doing with people at the Quality of Government Institute in, in Gothenburg, that political polarization has uh, also determined far greater levels of incidence of the pandemic in terms of excess mortality. But one factor that we're not a lot in finding is that levels of trust in the system, levels in, well, not in the system, but mainly levels of trust in other individuals, the actual degree of generalized trust is something that has played or seems to be playing less of a role than, for example, bridging social capital, uh, quality of institutions, or, for example, the level of sociability of any society. So once we put all this, we have that the pandemic has a very distinct geog geography, that this geography depends on a series of uh, characteristics, and this geography is likely to have certain impact. The impact on cities is going to be highly dependent on how long this pandemic uh, lasts. Hopefully, I hope that it will be over soon with vaccination uh, undergoing. But as I said before, we have had these false dawns, this idea that uh, last summer we thought that the worst was over and then we have seen not just one additional wave, but a second wave. And even now with uh, vaccination undergoing, there are talks of a fourth wave uh, arriving. But these changes in our lives over the last year are provoking four types of forces of change, uh, sorry, three types of forces of change that I'm going to discuss here, which and the first one is the most immediate impact, this social scarring that the pandemic might yield. The idea that, uh, because we know that the pandemic is transmitted from people to people and we need to keep social distancing, that uh, many of us have remained at home and uh, have been much more reluctant than uh, in the past. Uh, to meet with others. This is not just a question of lockdowns or of confinements or of government dictates. Um, uh, I am in a city that has had the biggest, well, some of the biggest incidents in, in Europe of the pandemic, but a city that has remained relatively open. And nevertheless, it's very difficult to meet anyone at this moment because people are far too reluctant to go out. And this is something that may recede for most relatively quickly after the health emergency, but for others, and let's hope it's a minority, it might leave long lasting psychological scars in which uh, meeting socially might become far rarer than what it was before um, a, a year ago. The second one is that there are going to be physical changes to the way um, the cities are structured and configurated 
mainly because in order to maintain social distance. Um, even when we return to normality, I don't think there's going to be the same normality as before, and probably we're going to be much more wary of hugging, of uh, shaking hands, of uh, talking close to one another. Perhaps it's a cultural thing, and it's going to be less of a change in some countries than others, in some cities than in others, but there's going to be uh, changes that are made, uh, especially to the physical environment, that are going to help maintain social distance in the considerable future, foreseeable future. And then probably the most important one is a byproduct of the pandemic, which is this forced social experiment that we are all living uh, in this, these lengthy confinements. Um, you all have noticed it. In the last year, we have transformed radically the way we shop, the way we work, and the way we socialize, the way we do conferences. Um, there are advantages and disadvantages to all of this. But these are all changes that were undergoing and the technology was already there. But the prediction was that this was going to take years, if not decades. Well, the change was done virtually overnight. Uh, I had to teach in person one week, the next week I was organizing debates online. Uh, I was working very much meeting my colleagues, doing research with them, interacting with my students, et cetera. Uh, for the last year, I've been working from the comfort, but also the prison of my uh, uh, home office. And these are some things that have been done on a massive scale, and many have realized that they have advantages. You can spend more time with your family. You have, uh, let's say, uh, less commuting time uh, for companies. They save money. They save money on space. They will need less space. But also, it uh, has implied, for many, Zoom fatigue, uh, much more difficulty or greater difficulties in order to make a distinction between work and uh, home space between private life and work life. And it has led to different forms of socializing that have allowed to connect to friends, long lost friends uh, in distant locations much more than hitherto, but nevertheless are considered by many uh, uh, unsatisfying. And this is something that is new. We don't know to what extent many of these things are going to remain under the pandemic. And this, here's where we have to speculate and take risks because your guess is as good as our, anyone else's guess. I mean, there's surveys going on about how the level of satisfaction, but it's a relatively new experiment. And they're already uh, having impact, a significant impact in the, on our cities. The online shopping is provoking what Richard Florida is calling, is calling this retail apocalypse, in which what you see here, this is a, a city uh, this year, in the UK, in which the downtown is suffering massively. Because first, we are shopping online, we're not allowed to go to downtown. Uh, even if we are allowed, we are reluctant to go into crowds and we are reluctant to go into closed spaces. And this is making a lot of retail that represents, let's not forget, in the case of the European Union, 15% of all employment fault. So maybe what we're seeing is that this is the initial step of a transformation of the use of space in the inner city. This is the office and uh, empty offices have been the norm. I cannot get into my office even if I try, even if I wanted uh, at the LSE, uh, simply because it's forbidden. And what you have is a lot of office space which is sitting idle at the moment. Uh, what is going to happen? Many of us are working from home, uh, companies are uh, assessing whether what how does this affect in terms of productivity and the monitoring of the work of uh, um, employees and the like but nevertheless what we're going to see is a situation that perhaps once we go back after the pandemic we're not going to go back to the office on a full-time basis that we're going to go perhaps to we're not going to be many of us working remotely also on a full-time basis but that we're going to go into mixed systems in which who knows? It's going to be two days a week at the office, three weeks from uh, three days from home, or three days at the office, three days from home, or some sort of combination with much more flexibility also in terms of commuting. 
and less retail, less uh, office work has implications for leisure activities in the cities. Uh, the fact that uh, restaurants are empty at the moment doesn't mean that all restaurants are going to be full afterwards. It might be the case. I might be wrong, but it might be that people might want to go to restaurants closer to their place with less commuting, less uh, contact with strangers in more open air spaces, something that was less common in the past where going into the city center and to do culture, to eat out and uh, to meet friends was uh, the absolute norm. So once you put all this together and you fast forward in time, this can have a significant impact on territories. And here we have to distinguish between two dimensions, two scales of the impact. The first one is the macro geography. And this is what some have been highlighting, this idea of the death of the big city or the challenge to the functions of the big city. The idea that because now we can work remotely, now that we are looking for a better quality of life, uh, less, we're going to have to commute less. We're looking for more outdoor space in order to prevent for, because of fear of contagion. And we are realizing that there are advantages that this is going to be even opportunity to reverse the concentration of economic activity that we have witnessed over the last three to four decades that places like Paris or Madrid are going to lose out and that there's going to be a lot of activity taking place in places like Limoges or Tours or uh, you are going to be able to work from uh, Chambéry and Annecy or you're going to be able to work from Murcia and have a much better uh, work-life balance than what was before in terms of uh, large people of the population, uh, large shares of the population living in big cities and uh, not affording to have a high quality of life in those cities. <sighs> Is this going to happen? Well, my prediction and that of uh, Richard Florida and uh, Michael Storper, is that after the pandemic, cities are going to rebound. That uh, in fact, the macro geography and the systems of cities and the relationship between big cities, medium-sized cities, town and rural areas is going to remain relatively st stable. That many large cities that have been doing well are going to continue to do well, that some are not going to um, uh, rebound as well, but that although there will be potential for many intermediate cities, rural areas to actually catch up and catch up significantly, these are going to be the exceptions that are rather than the rules. Places like Austin might be able to do that. Places that are not too far away from Paris, like for example, Orléans or, or, or tours that offer certain amenities um, that are also relatively accessible. You have to commute into an office in the big cities one or two days a week may thrive but is not going to reach all places. And many areas are ill-prepared uh, for this. Um, the work that has been doing by, has been done in recent uh, months by colleagues of Rudiger at the OECD, uh, Paolo Veneri and his team on remote working is clearly indicative of this. Big cities today are far better prepared, not just in terms of accessibility to digital infrastructure, which is becoming much more universal because of the type of jobs that are being conducted there and the type of skills that are needed, much more prepared to actually face this sort of digital revolution than many rural areas, many lagging behind areas and many remote areas. So probably that uh, geography is going to happen. There's going to be uh, a polarization that's going to remain, if not increase, between the large city and the uh, small town, and especially many rural areas are likely to lose out. Some with special amenities, uh, some with uh, uh, better connectivity, may gain from uh, all these uh, uh, workers that are going to be working a bit more uh, remotely, but nevertheless, they are still going to be the minority. Perhaps the biggest transformations are going to take place within the city itself. Um, what we are seeing at the moment is um, that many uh, high street shops are disappearing, that in many large cities, um, rental prices are going down, if not crumbling, like in places like London, 
property prices are not at the moment, but probably the city that we're going to have once we emerge from the pandemic, the inner city is going to be far different, more different, because there's going to be less need for office space, there's going to be less need for retail space, and if there's less retail activity and less work uh, conducted in the inner city, as I was saying before, probably also less need for residential space. So we're going to have to reinvent what the city is about, and probably the biggest beneficiaries are going to be the suburbs, perhaps not like this one over here, but outer suburbs that offer more space uh, and relatively uh, uh, good accessibility to the inner city, that you can keep the amenities and the advantages of the large city without losing the advantages of having more outdoor space, better schools and a more affordable uh, living. So perhaps not in the at the level of what was seen in the post-war period of suburbanization in the United States. But nevertheless, probably suburbs are going to uh, be the biggest beneficiaries. However, the change in the city center offers opportunities for a renovation, for resync in the city. Uh, if people move out, there were going to be other people that would move in. And the cities would always offer this uh, capacity the inner city for interaction, for a new idea, for the generation of tacit knowledge that is going to create and lead to greater creativity, to greater innovation. And my, we might see a rebirth of the city more as a, as a cultural hub at the beginning, more, more as, a, as an outdoor space, and as, how, as a place to meet uh, with friends outdoors, but also as a place for a different type of creativity, uh, a different type of ideas, much more, uh, let's say, I, would, I was going to say dynamic, not necessarily dynamic, uh, much more uh, different than what it is before. And there are a lot of researchers that have been thinking about this. What type of city we're going to have? Is it going to be a 15 minute city, uh, like Moreno is highlighting in the case of uh, Paris? Is it, are we going to go for more sustainable transport, uh, transportation, more into bicycles, into uh, scooters or trottinettes, as they are known in France. Uh, are we going to have a, a greater create, uh, creative city? Are we going to have a new residential use of cities so that might lead to eventually in the city centers to a boom in population? Is it going to be more of a leisure city? Is it an open city? This is all the things that we need to uh, discuss, but probably the cities that are taken the lead in these transformations are going to be far better prepared for what this pandemic is offering. And I'm conscious of the time. Let me just finish um, here with some conclusions about this uh, general overview. Um, we have a pandemic and this pandemic is affecting the role of cities. How much it affects the role of cities is going to depend on a number of factors. The first is going to be how big is, has the incidence of the pandemic been in every single place. And probably the transformation is going to be far greater in those areas that have been the hardest hits. But also what have been the measures that have been adopted to get out of the crisis and how fast you have adopted those, those measures. We are seeing cities like Paris that have in many ways been at the forefront of the transformation where other cities have been far much uh, more slower to, to react, uh, slower to react. In other cases, uh, we are going to see what is the capacity of cities, of decision makers, of economic and social actors to actually redefine the uses and spaces of the cities, how the city is, is capable of transforming itself into something new. But overall, what we can say is that the pandemic with all its negative impact and with all its uh, terrible toll, is going to offer or is offering an opportunity to rethink our cities and their relationship with others, with other spaces. Because let's face it, our cities had a lot of advantages, but were also places of polarization. There was nowhere where the interpersonal differences, both in terms of income, but also the problems of race were higher, for example, or diversity um, higher than in our cities. And, uh, it might create this opportunity for a change in living conditions and those cities that are capable of creating a better ecosystem to 
facilitate the development of new idea, ideas to attract new talent are probably going to be the ones emerging in a better condition in this post-pandemic world. As I said, not all cities are going to have the same ability to adapt. It would depend very much on the institutional, political, social, and economic conditions. Uh, but on the whole, there's an opportunity and these cities are there to, we have this opportunity to generate a far more efficient, fair and sustainable territorial system. So thank you very much. Uh, I hope you liked it and uh, I'm really looking forward to hearing Rudiger and to try to answer any other questions you might have later on. Okay, shall, shall I come in directly or? Yes, please, Rudiger, uh, go ahead. Thank you. Okay, good. Uh, well, I mean, thanks a lot. I first wanted to, I mean, uh, thank you, Jerome and, and Ron for inviting me. I mean, it's a pleasure and honor for me to be here and also Andres for his really great presentation. Um, I, I have a problem because basically, I mean, um, it's, it's not only a very nice paper what you presented, but it's also kind of like, I mean, we in the OECD, we had come to very similar conclusions. So basically, I mean, uh, there's very little that I'm not in agreement with. Maybe the only thing that I really don't agree with is kind of like, I mean, you're saying that basically, I mean, the schools in the suburbs are better than in the inner cities. But I think that's a very US centric uh, um, thought because in a lot of European countries and also in Asian countries that I know better, um, I mean, you have some of the best schools which are actually more in the, in the city center. So that, that's basically, that's probably my main point of criticism of the paper, which is a totally minimal point, which way shows you how much I agree with everything you have been saying. So what I'll be saying in the way will just kind of like basically to enrich and maybe give some more um, additional material to some of the, the uh, um, thoughts and uh, conclusions that you've been presenting basically. Um, the first point I wanted to make is kind of like just give a bit of a, um, an overview of the process of urbanization because basically, I mean, there's, as I was saying, there's a lot of talk that kind of like, now that's the end of urbanization, the process is reverting, stopping or anything. Um, it don't. Um, basically, in 1975, there were, there were 1.5 billion people living in cities with more than 50,000 inhabitants. In 2015, it was 3.5 3 billion. So it went from 1.5 to 3.5. It's projected to go to 5 billion by 2050. So now if it's a couple of hundred thousand less, maybe because of COVID, um, you still see, I mean, the trend is so strong. Um, this is, I mean, this is not going to be stopped by, by like one pandemic. Also, I mean, um, what needs to be understood is a lot of people are in cities because they want to be in cities. It's not kind of like they're forced to be in cities. I mean, when, when you're doing, for example, um, surveys about the satisfaction, uh, um, life satisfaction of people, I mean, you see very, very large differences between the satisfaction in, in the cities and in the uh, semi-dense areas and the rural areas. And people come to the cities because I mean, they're having higher income levels and also better amenities and higher levels of satisfaction generally. Now, during COVID, that may have been slightly different, but in normal times, I mean, that's that's the reason why the cities are growing. It's not kind of like some, you know, some somebody who's forcing the people to do that. It's individual choices who are adding up to that, basically. And, and also kind of like, I mean, if you're looking at a more, um, case-based observations. For example, in France and Paris, you have a lot of people who are kind of like complaining about being Paris all the time. But you know, we economists, I mean, we always kind of like tend to think that actions of people speak a lot louder than their words. And when in France, for example, you're looking at teachers or pharmacists or doctors, I mean, that's all professions where you can do anywhere in France and where, by the way, um, you know, there's a lot of empty spaces in the rural areas and a lot in a large part of France because most of those people prefer to be in the Paris area. So kind of like what I'm trying to say here, and especially for more educated people is, there's a huge premium for people to being in cities and the perception of uh, satisfaction, and that's not going to go away um, if we return to a kind of normal situation after COVID. Um, the other point I wanted to make also kind of like, I mean, with respect to the urbanization process, you know, this going from 3.5 to 5 billion, most of that is actually not happening in France or Germany or in the US. Most of that happen is happening in the developing and in the emerging economies in Africa and in Asia. And in those countries, I mean, people, when they are moving from the countryside to the cities, I mean, they're taking a lot of risks already anyway. And for them, kind of like, most of them are young also, for them, COVID is just an additional small risk. So, I mean, it's really hard to see why, you know, pandemics like COVID would really kind of like have any major impact on their location decisions um, going forward. So, I mean, it really is, 
highly unlikely. Basically, I mean, not. I mean, I, I don't see it happen in any possible way uh, that urbanization is stopping, unless obviously, I mean, we would be having kind of like, I mean, plagues like the pest, which is killing one third of the population or something like that. But then we would be in a different world, and even then, cities would pres presumably bounce back after some decades. Um, so basically, when we're talking about the, the, the spatial impact of the COVID pandemic, in reality, we're talking about the richer countries, because in the, in the countries um, where the population is poorer, I mean, um, the, the, the location decision is much more driven by economic opportunity and less by kind of like, you know, these small risks like COVID, as many people will, will, will perceive it there. So basically, we're talking about, I mean, to face it, to be about high income countries, where we'll see most of these effects we're talking about. Now, basically, in, in Andrew's paper, um, there's basically three factors that, uh, that can change the distribution of the population and the, the form of cities. There's a social scaring. So basically, people have been hurt by COVID and now will want to have different lifestyles, different choices in the future. There's the cost experiment. So that kind of like we've all uh, learned to, to, to shop uh, via internet and we've all learned how to use Zoom and to do webinars and to telework. And uh, then the third point is that the urban environment will be changing to reflect needs, needs from COVID. And um, in the paper, I think they're, they're, they're treated more or less um, as equally importantly. But I mean, then Andres was clearly saying in his presentation that he thinks the, uh, the force experiment ones is the most important ones. And I, and I totally agree with that. Um, I think the social scaring will go away relatively quickly, unless obviously we are in a, in a new equilibrium where we'll have like pandemics every five years. Um, there will be some people who will be affected by that who may be moving to countryside or something. But I mean, overall, I think the numbers will be comparatively small. And so that's not going to drive very much an urban reallocation. Um, the securing the urban environment point, um, I think there we're going to see very massive changes, but that's also in a way because um, that's been reinforcing trends and um, um, plans by cities and um, planners uh, that were in the in the drawers anyway. And uh, with COVID, there was a very good moment to, to implement them. I'm talking, for example, about the fact that of having more more bike lanes to kind of like promoting active transport. I mean, having wider sidewalks to uh, transforming parking space into space for citizens, for example, by allowing restaurants to have tables and chairs outside and so on. So I think that that was all in the cards anyway. And, and that's something that has been coming with COVID and I think that's going to stay. So, I mean, it will make a, a very large I mean, changes in that direction. And, um, but I agree, I mean, the largest impact will be from the fact that the possibility of teleworking will be there, that the, the transition to online shopping has been massively accelerated uh, during the, the during COVID, because I mean, people have been getting used to it, and uh, I mean, uh, now for them it's so much easier to do that in many respects. So I mean, I mean, we're seeing we're going to see massive uh, massive changes there. Um, now, one one aspect I mean that uh, also Andres has been uh, stressing very much in his presentation, which is maybe stressed less in the paper, is the impact of attractiveness. I mean, a lot of talk goes about kind of like, oh, people don't need to commute to work that often anymore so they can locate further away from the, the working spaces. And I agree on that. I mean, that, that's a factor. But the second very important axis is attractiveness because if you're teleworking, you can not only be further away from where your, your job is, but you can also choose to be in, in a place that you like to be attractive, that you like basically. And uh, that means basically that, um, um, there will be an increasing premium to attractiveness and attractiveness can, can mean different things to different people. But generally speaking, you know, people like sun, people like amenities, people like other people like themselves, um, people like places, nature to some degree where they have good schools and so on and so forth. So I mean, it gives you an idea what the places are. And um, then also, I mean, there's, I mean, two types of people basically. I mean, there's the people who can really be totally away from their workplace. I mean, I, there's some, you know, in the press, you can read there's a certain community um, of, uh, of professionals that has been installed themselves uh, on, the, um, on, the, on the Spanish islands and uh, who are very much into surfing and, uh, and who are kind of like, I mean, architects or whatever, working basically from, from their flats and they have created co-working spaces. And uh, so, I mean, that, I mean, that's places who are extremely attractive to certain types of people and who may congregate in those places. 
And so, I mean, that, that's the, uh, the type of areas that they benefit. And then also kind of like, I mean, the, um, the function of cities, I mean, the space that the city kind of like is um, providing livelihoods to when people live there, it has been increasing, I mean, very max, I mean, has been increasing largely. And that's also Andres has been mentioning that. So basically what we are seeing is kind of like a shift to further outside the large agglomerations that work, that work well. But I mean, I don't think we're just seeing a, a flattening of the, you know, cradling, cradling house prices, something like that. I mean, there is some evidence of that happening in the US. But I think what we'll ultimately see is that people will either be in the inner center areas that are attractive, or they'll be moving out further than the traditional uh, suburban spaces. Because I mean, you know, if you are if you're moving out anyway, you may as well move, move further out, um, as long as you can still get into the city like twice or twice a week. Um, reasonably well um, but I mean then you can have basically you know a bigger house a bigger garden or you can have it more cheaply um, so I mean there's not much point being kind of like in the you know relative still higher density intermediate parts uh, that may not be so attractive from an amenity point of view uh, and where the main attraction for people has been to be close to the workspace well if you don't need to go there that often anymore I mean then I mean though I think those places will see a much larger interest in population than other places. Now, having said that, I mean, we are in a situation where at least for the, the bigger cities, a large part of the population has been priced out of living in the cities. So if prices go down, that doesn't mean that a lot of people, I mean, will be uh, a lot less people will be living, ending up in the cities, but it may also give an opportunity to other um, parts of the society and especially also to young people or maybe more artistic oriented people to be moving, moving back into the city centers. So, I mean, I mean, it may, after all, also not be such a bad thing if we see a certain house price decline in the city center so that, I mean, housing becomes more affordable. I mean, in the OCD, I mean, you know, we are, we are dealing with the policymakers each day. And one of the top topics we're having in any discussion is affordability of housing, housing sector and housing prices, especially in the big cities. And uh, that, that's a topic, you know, 20 years nobody was talking about. But I mean, it really is one of the number one policy concerns at the moment. So if there was improvement in that area, that would not be so um, so much of a drama, basically. Um, then I also wanted to say something about rural areas more specifically. There is a lot of hope in the rural community that basically this teleworking, um, that will be a revival of the rural areas. And I agree that it will help certain rural areas. It will help rural areas. Uh, which are relatively close to the big agglomerations, but which have still been too far away to basically be viable places for commuting so far. And it may also help certain rural com communities that have very specific assets, kind of like you can surf, I mean, you can mountain climb or, you know, whatever kind of like people really care about. And those may be very much benefiting from that. But I mean, I don't see, and I agree there is Andres, I don't see that uh, there'll be a a widespread shift to all rural areas. I mean, just, I mean, as I was saying earlier, attractiveness is going to be a very important feature of individuals' location decision going forward. And um, I mean, there are certain places that people perceive as more attractive than others, and then that's where they're going to locate. So it's as simple as that, basically. Um, then, I mean, obviously what we're going to see um, this, how shall I say, mega suburbanization uh, going forward will have a certain amount of challenges because it's basically, I mean, um, a type of urban sprawl to a certain degree. Um, so I mean, it will entail all the uh, the negative aspects that we know from from this literature, basically. And also, um, we've been showing and working in the OCD in, in recent years that metropolitan governance is really important. And if basically the metropolitan areas in a way become much, much bigger because I mean, part of the people are now living even further out, I mean, that may also kind of like put a, a larger, um, may, would, will make it even more complex to have governance structures uh, that um, function with having a whole metropolitan area in, in mind, basically. Um, then I just want to make a last point, which is maybe a bit, going away from what we've been talking about, that's basically about resilience. I mean, we're talking about a lot about resilience these days uh, when we're talking about COVID. And, um, and, and there is, um, I think there is a, 
fundamental misunderstanding, basically. I mean, our world is getting more complex each day and urbanization is a factor which is making our world a lot less resilient. It's true that cities and urban areas are typically more economically resilient, but when it comes to physical resilience, so kind of like you know, what happens when there is no electricity, when there's a trot, um, or when there's like a COVID pandemic or something like that, it is simple that if there's lower densities and rural areas, I mean, people have um, better possibilities to kind of like, I mean, react in those circumstances than when you're having high density cities, which are extremely complex constructions. And that's something we just need to understand and that we need to take into account. I mean, that doesn't mean obviously that we shouldn't have large cities because there's a lot of good reasons why we should have them, but it means we need to be aware that they're just not as resilient as uh, our societies in a way are not as resilient as in the time where most of the people lived in the countryside. And that means also that we need to be prepared in a much larger sense for resilience and especially in, in, the, in the urban areas. And uh, there, I think uh, there has been happening very little. Um, I always thought, you know, there was a lot of contingency plans in the, uh, in the drawers of the governments for, play, for things like COVID, apparently there wasn't. So now I have come to the conclusion that probably for other types of disasters, the situation would be very similar. So, I mean, in a way that's a um, call that we should be thinking a lot more about resilience and what we need to do to make our places um, more resilient in the first place and to also have them to adapt better when they're, when they're stroked by another catastrophe. Because, I mean, you know, I mean, you always say generals are fighting the last war. So probably the next thing, the next big thing that's going to hit us, it's not going to be COVID-2, but it's going to do something very different. And, uh, and we better start preparing for different, you know, uh, other um, types of events like COVID so that when, when something happens, we're better prepared. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Rudiger, for your very thorough and comprehensive uh, uh, response uh, to the talk of Andres. I, I really like it. These were really, really good comments. Uh, so you did uh, both an excellent job. Um, so as a chair, I'm a bit, uh, I'm getting a bit nervous though, uh, because we uh, basically uh, have uh, about seven minutes to go which of course I really enjoyed listening to you, uh, but there are also in the meantime, many questions have come in on my phone. Um, so um, I, I still would like to address a few of those, uh, if, if that's okay for you. And then I would uh, like to give Andres the final word uh, so he can respond to Rüdiger and also maybe to the, uh, some questions that, uh, that I will refer to. I won't make it long. I just, uh, I just will add uh, more comments to the ones that have already been mentioned. Um, first of all, um, and, and it's ba basically a, a comment of myself, I take the privilege of, uh, of, of doing that, uh, being a chair, is that um, uh, what you, Andres, showed is that uh, the factors uh, that uh, make cities most hard hit uh, are basically uh, health indicators, right, uh, like uh, uh, excessive, excessive uh, um, um, death. Uh, or a uh, uh, high uh, number of COVID cases. Um, so, um, and then you explain uh, what factors might be responsible for that, right? Uh, poor institutions or high connectivity or high density. But of course, there's also um, um, a part of the resilience debate is not about uh, which one uh, are uh, hit uh, uh, um, hard most, but also which one will recover economically speaking, right? So are not the same factors that you mentioned that will hard, uh, hit hard cities most, like high density, high connective, poor institutions, bridging social capital, that that are, the, are also the, the factors that will contribute to a full recovery, economic recovery of cities that are most, uh, that are hit uh, uh, hard. So that's uh, one question. Another question uh, uh, I think I came in, I, I really liked. I got many, so I just have to make a selection. Uh, and I just read out uh, uh, um, literally, uh, we hear a lot about measures to support those that can change lifestyles, work remotely, use the cities in new ways, enjoy new urban programs. But Andres is aware that the majority of people cannot do that. They are restricted by jobs, cost of house, uh, cost of life, housing availability, et cetera. So rather than reinventing the use and mobility of the city for those who can change, shouldn't we be more worrying about preparedness and mitigation measures for those who cannot? Um, 
then there were a few questions. Uh, let me uh, see whether I can find it um, on uh, the role of high tech. Um, let me see. Sorry, I got so many. Um, now I have difficulties to find them. Um, yes. Um, so, uh, there's one question. Does it mean that cities that are highly spent in tech sectors will face more transfer transformations than others, right? So is there also some kind of effect there, uh, cities that are more specialized in tech sectors, because they might promote more remote working, things like that, and therefore cities might be more prone to do that. Um, that uh, was, on, and then I think the last question, I think then uh, we have more than enough. Um, that is about uh, an, an, a topic, uh, Andres, that you are interested yourself. Uh, uh, it's about uh, uh, populist uh, voting. And uh, uh, so here's a question about what is the link between voting and elected populist on the one hand and the management of the pandemic in metropolitan areas on the other hand? Do you see there's a link between the two? Okay, I think I'll leave it to that. I give the floor to you, Andres. Hey, so thank you very much, Ron, and thank you very much to everyone who has uh, put the questions and see that there are a lot of questions coming in the chat. I'm going to try to be brief also to let Rudiger uh, go into some of the questions because I think he probably has quite a lot of things to say about this. Um, factors and resilience. Um, you, well, I, my analysis has been about the factors that have been connected to the incidence of the pandemic. But these are factors that in general reflect the capacity of different societies, of different regions, of different uh, countries and cities to actually react to shocks and to rebound from shocks. So I would not be surprised that as if you hinted, uh, Ron, that uh, on the one hand, having a well-prepared health system, having a well-prepared, uh, let's say a more efficient uh, institutions, more efficient government, uh, having uh, more bridging in social capital, like many other, say, institutional factors, having greater density and having also uh, more accessibility are going to contribute to uh, allow these cities to rebound economically. Because in many of these factors have been generally considered as assets for economic development and uh, in the past, and they have also proven to be assets for also um, uh, not just economic development, but also for the handling of the pandemic. So very much, I would say that as uh, Rudy was hinting for any type of shock and the next shock is going to be probably a very different shock than, than this one is going to adopt another guys, uh, you have to be prepared. And those, that preparedness is going to lead to greater prosperity, greater equality and greater economic dynamism. Second question about, should we worry about those who cannot move? And uh, should we worry about, uh, I think we should worry precisely about those who cannot move. But the problem is that there's some sort of optimistic thinking, I would say, around the handling of the pandemic and what's going to happen afterwards. It says, uh, as, if, as if the pandemic with all its problems is giving a massive opportunity that's going to make solve problems as if by magic that first is going to allow those people that live in declining regions to be better off because they're going to see a wealth of, let's say, new activities coming their way from those activities that are leaving the big cities. It's also the case that within the cities, if people are leaving the city center, then, and there's more space and prices are going down, what we're going to have is more affordability is going to, for the people that are stuck in the cities, we're going to see uh, more capacity of these people to move up, let's say the, the housing and real estate ladder, and therefore we don't need to do policies. The problem is this is not going to be the reality, or I don't think that's going to be the reality. The reality is going to be that although some more remote areas, but mostly more connected areas are going to benefit, in the end, as Rudy was highlighting, we want to live in cities. And therefore, we're not going to solve no pandemic or no shock without active policy and active intervention is going to solve the problems of places falling behind. Even if 
there's greater affordability for a time because, of course, Rudy was saying people are going to go back to cities and then there's going to bring prices up. There's greater uh, affordability for a, uh, for a time. If people are losing their jobs in retail, if people are losing their jobs in the gig economy because uh, then they have to go move to the suburbs, right? these people are not going to benefit from any greater affordability within the cities. So there are going to be much greater problems. So we need to plan and we need to intervene. There's a, more, there's a need for more and especially for better policy, not for less policy. The uh, pandemic is not going to, to make the problems go away. In many cases, it's exacerbating those problems, both within and outside, as outside, outside cities. And we need to think right now about how we're we going to cope with those problems because then it's going to become too late. Um, are those cities with the biggest tech sectors the ones that are going to experiment the biggest changes? My understanding is it's the opposite. If you have a city, especially in this world, and I think Simona is going to be talking about this uh, next uh, week of platform, platform economies, of concentration of big development projects in uh let's say large urban hubs um, and much greater capacity for these firms large firms to connect globally to the client without the middleman what we're going to see is that precisely as many intermediate cities and small cities and rural areas that are going to keep on suffering in a few years time san francisco might regard this and the bay area might regard this as a just a bump on the road why? Because they concentrate some of the most high-tech and advanced companies and they're going to keep on thriving. The problem is going to be that if everyone goes and moves to uh, do shopping online, retail activity is a big part of the, life, the lives and the employment of a lot of our cities in places like Europe but in other parts of the world. And these are the ones that are going to suffer and going to suffer mo most. So probably there's going to be a bigger transformation and that picture of the boarded houses that I put, uh, boarded, not boarded houses, the boarded uh, high street that I put from the UK is not from London. It's actually from a medium sized city in the Midlands, the ones that are highlighting the biggest discontent. So in that respect, because we're going towards a digital economy and as highlighted by the commentators that are working on this, uh, Jonathan Dingle, for example, but the work that is being done by the OCD, um, this is more likely to give an advantage to those areas where we see the concentration of these more advanced, highly uh, high-tech firms and the greatest levels of skills. The rest are going to have to reinvent themselves and are going to have to do it fast, so there's a need to intervene. And then on the question of populist voting and whether they have done, um, populist leaders have done better or worse. Uh, here, I haven't done any research and it's, it's something that's going to be mainly anecdotal. But uh, if we're looking overall at uh, now that we have a, a year of a pandemic in the horizon, at least in, uh, since it became global, um, and we're seeing at uh, former populist leaders like Donald Trump that the solution comes mainly from not wearing face masks and uh, uh, probably going and getting some sort of bleach that would uh, solve the problem. If we're looking at the attitude of cavalier attitude of leaders in certain parts of the world, like for example, Bolsonaro, extreme right uh, leader in Brazil, or Andres López Obrador uh, from uh, the polar opposite in, um, in, let's say, in the political spectrum, but I would say very close in terms of populism uh, to, uh, to Bolsonaro. And we see how these countries are behaving. I do not think that uh, populist leaders of populism and populist voting is the solution for any sort of shocks. In fact, what we have seen is, with some exceptions, that those societies that are far better prepared for any type of shock, that, that means they got better quality institutions, institutions that have been improving over time. They got better social capital of the right type, the bridging type of social capital. They got uh, uh, more trust uh, from their individuals in, in society in the decisions of scientists. Those are the ones that are going to come out much better out of it. And it's uh, no surprise that uh, uh, places like Denmark, places like Norway, places like Finland, and with some caveats, because there's a lot of debate, places like Sweden would probably come out far better 
out of this pandemic and their cities and their regions than in most other parts of the world, and mainly because the level of preparedness to any type of shock uh, is going to be uh, is far greater there than elsewhere. Okay, many thanks, uh, Andres. Uh, I think uh, um, uh, we already uh, are uh, after uh, seven, so I think uh, we have uh, uh, to come to a close. Um, I think, Jérôme, yes, you would like to say yeah, something? Just to make a suggestion, because we, we received many, many questions in the chat, something like 30 or 40 questions, so I have a suggestion. People from Toulouse that are connected today can can will be able to meet you in June to ask face to face the question in a restaurant or in a, or in a bar. Thank you very much. In any case, I don't know about Rudiger, really but I'm I'm open to I'm, I can stay for longer, so there's no. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, Ron. I let you conclude. Yeah. Uh, um, okay, uh, Andres, are you inviting Rudiger to give feedback on your comments or? Uh, absolutely, yes. If uh, Rüdiger, you would like to say? No, yeah, I, I have I have time. Can you stay a bit longer as well? Uh, yes, I mean, I, I wanted to echo what was Andres has been saying. I mean, um, basically, after the global financial crisis, I mean, what you saw is that actually the um, the cities were much much harder hit than the rural areas because that's where kind of like you know the, the financial sector had been concentrating and so on. But nonetheless, it's the cities that bounced back much much more quickly. And, and, and the rural area and, and, and the lagging areas that suffered a lot more from the crisis. I mean, with which they had basically nothing to do, but I mean, they still were the ones who suffered most from it. So now in this crisis, the situation is a bit different. I mean, there is certain cities or certain sectors in cities that have been hit, but there's also certain uh, more and more rural regions that have been hit. For example, places that are depending a lot on tourism. I mean, they've been hammered. I mean, there's almost there's been almost no tourism last year. Um, so, I mean, I mean, what, what I'm trying to say here is basically, I mean, this crisis uh, has been, has had a very unequal impact that's not been specific to cities, but has been much more eclectic in a sense. I mean, it was hard to, to imagine a crisis that would be kind of like hitting these different groups. And um, so I'm not very much concerned about the cities because I think they'll be bouncing back really quickly. And the real problem is the, the regions that have been having problems already before. And uh, that will have been problems coming back also after this crisis. And that also are the ones who are typically uh, more heavily affected by, by shocks like the automation. Um, that, 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 that's an ongoing trend on, on top of everything we are seeing. Then, I mean, that's on the spatial inequality side, basically. And I agree with Andres. I mean, unless we are, we are doing something for these places, I mean, um, um, we're, we're not going to reduce the, the spatial inequality. Um, then, um, if you're looking at individual inequality, um, there's two types of people that have been mostly affected by the crisis. I mean, the one is kind of like, I mean, less educated workers, um, where many of them are, have lost their job or will be losing their jobs in, in the near future. I mean, it's typically people who are having um, more problems of getting a, in a job in the first place. I mean, who are the first then to kind of like, I mean, let go in these situations. So that, that's, that's very problematic on the one hand. On the other hand, um, there's also a lot of um, relatively um, highly qualified people who are either working as independents or have been you know, like shop owners or, or things like that, small enterprises that are still surviving at the moment because basically nobody is, is, is uh, becoming, um, there's, there's no uh, bankruptcies at the moment, but I mean, that's just postponed. I mean, at some point there'll be some reckoning and if you have like a shop and you haven't been getting any, uh, you know, any uh, any income for almost a year and a half or something, and not necessary very large uh, subsidies by the government in all sectors, um, then a lot of them are just going to go bankrupt. I mean, there's no way around that. Also, with the shifts that we've been talking about, that Andres has been mentioning in the shopping behavior, I mean, that will also, I mean, try to away from bankruptcies going forward. So, I mean, we're going to see a, a very, quite massive um, impact on the on the distributional side. It's not. You know, just the rich ones or just the poor ones who are suffering, it's more complex, but there are certain groups that, that are very hard hit or will be very hard hit, and that is likely to create um, social and possibly also political problems going forward. So that's the, on that point. And um, I, I will not be commenting on the populist voting because that's something the OCB doesn't do, basically. Okay, uh, thanks, uh, Rüdiger. Um, 
I have another question here. Um, it's about uh, the quality of institutions, right? Uh, Andres, you mentioned that that was uh, it's a major factor uh, uh, that uh, makes uh, why some cities uh, uh, are better capable of handling uh, the crisis uh, uh, than other. Um, but uh, um, um, at the same time, uh, we saw that uh, there were some uh, um, um, when I, uh, when we looked at your maps. Uh, there were also many uh, uh, cities and regions in, in Europe that actually have a low quality of government, as we know, and that were pretty resilient. They look pretty resilient to, uh, to the pandemic crisis. So, so how do you reconcile those two? Well, this all comes from the type of analysis that has been done. As, as analysis that has been done controlling for the country characteristics, whether it is through uh, country dummies or country fixed effects, or by the inclusion of a national variable like the national quality of government, levels of decentralization, or uh, the change in the quality of government. So once you control for all those things, you have to realize that everything else being equal is much better to have a better quality of government and a quality of government that has not deteriorated but has improved over time than to have a weaker quality of government. Also, uh, in fact, uh, one of the good things of the first wave, which hasn't happened, and perhaps in the second wave, is that uh, many of these areas in Central and Eastern Europe, but also in Southeastern Europe, such as Greece, uh, Hungary, for example, Poland, were not the first ones to, to be hit. And probably because they were more conscious that uh, they were less prepared they adopted decisions far quicker than countries that were more confident and cities in those countries that were more, more confident. In the first wave, there were four countries in Europe that had, were hit the hardest. One was Italy, the first uh, hit uh, uh, when it came to Europe. And then it was Spain, the UK and Belgium. Uh, it's a coincidence or it might be there's something behind that these are precisely the four countries where the quality of government, albeit still being relatively high in comparison to these other Central and Eastern European countries, had been declining the most over the last 20 years. So probably, whereas probably in the, in the case of Italy, when say they didn't expect it, they, they were the first hit, so they took the first uh, bullet. In the case of the other three, Spain, Belgium, and the UK, maybe there was a bit of overconfidence that was not present in those areas that were acutely aware that if they didn't take measures and harsh measures very quickly, they would suffer more. All right, thanks uh, very much. Okay, I think uh, um, 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 we leave it to that. Uh, it's uh, it's a quarter past uh, seven. Uh, uh, so uh, I thank you very much, uh, Andres. Uh, I thank you very much, Rudiger, uh, for your excellent contribution. I really enjoyed listening to it. Uh, I learned a lot uh, uh, during the session. So it was a very, very good meeting. Uh, thank you for your availability and for your uh, uh, very interesting contribution. Uh, Jerome, would you still like to add something? Yeah, you have to unmute yourself. Jerome? Your mic. Ah, sorry, I forgot my microphone, yeah. No, I just would like to thank also uh, uh, Rodiger, Andres, and you, Ron, for the very exciting uh, webinar. Uh, we had a uh, little bit more than 50 people, and for the French people in the French community, we will make a translation of the, of the talk, and, and we'll uh, put the video on 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 YouTube for for the French community that's that speak English very very well. So thank you very much. It was a very good presentation and seminars. Thank you very much for the yeah. invitation. Thanks to Rudiger as well, and also thanks to everyone that has been listening throughout. And before, yes, thanks. And, 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 <laughs> please, Rudiger. I just wanted to say thank you to everybody. I really also enjoyed the the discussion. It was great. Yes. So thanks very much uh, for your contribution. Uh, see you soon. And uh, uh, I just want to uh, uh, draw a final attention to uh, to the uh, uh, the workshop we will have uh, next week. Uh, on, on the 18th of March, uh, 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 we start at 5 p.m. Uh, till 7. And then Simona uh, uh, will take over. 
uh, and 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 Peter Birgovic uh, from the European Commission uh, uh, will be her uh, discussion. So I would all uh, very uh, uh, welcome you next time uh, to uh, uh, to participate again in this uh, in this uh, session. So thank you very much. Have a nice evening, and uh, see you all uh, next week. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Bye bye.